So good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Luca, and I'm the Communication and Dissemination Manager of the Work Project. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today's online symposium on innovating port logistics operations. And uh, so this virtual symposium, were, were, uh, it's organized by three European Union funded projects, a work uh, multi-reload and for freight, each at the forefront of improving port operations through automation. So as you can see from the agenda, they the event will last about one hour and 30 minutes and we'll basically have two main sessions. The first will be the project presentation showcasing achievements and progress where the three projects uh, will be presented. And then in the second session, um, we will have a panel discussion on the future of port automation uh, technologies. Uh, at the end of which um, you will have about uh, 10, 15 minutes, let's see, uh, to ask questions to the panelists and the speakers. So, of course, I also encourage you to actively uh, participate during the meeting. Um, so now it is my pleasure, of course, to introduce you our general moderator for the day with extensive experience in innovation project in the in inland navigation, Robert Raphael, general manager of Pro Danube. Uh, Robert, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning from the cloudy and rainy Vienna. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Robert Rafael is my name representing ProDanube and also the multi reload uh, project together with my colleague Christian Stark, who was very active in preparing this uh, workshop together with the award and the four freight teams. Uh, thank you for that already and thank you for the high number of, of uh, participants. I have a very easy task uh, because everything is prepared, as you can see from uh, from the printouts. Uh, I just need to guide you through this uh, this uh, liaison event. I can say uh, for the multi reload project, it's a it's a great pleasure to to be the, the the moderator and in this sense in the in the center part of the project. Yesterday we had our midterm review meeting with the senior project officer and he was very happy and, and welcoming about this uh, this liaison event. Uh, I think it's very well appreciated how the projects cooperate in this. We have an exciting agenda today, as mentioned already, short project presentation, but we have asked the presenters to pick, more importantly, to pick relevant topics for, for the development of ports in the automation and, and digitalization sphere, and then uh, panel discussion. Without further ado, I would already uh, ask or maybe one uh, uh, housekeeping, but I, I see that everyone is prepared for that. Please mute your microphones if you are not speaking. The chat box is also available and we will try to manage in, in good collaboration with Luca and, and his team. Uh, so as mentioned, there will be some uh, online polls during the presentations uh, where you can answer uh, with with your with your inputs. Uh, and when it comes to yeah, here is the first question already on the screen. And when it comes to presentations, uh, we will stick to the order as sent out in the agenda. The award project, the multi reload project, followed up with the four freight project, each of them having 15 minutes uh, for the presentation. I think all of the presenters are here, so it's my pleasure to first uh, introduce uh, Dr. Laura Hashimi on behalf of the award project, uh, who is a senior innovation manager at Enide, which is a Spanish based company. Uh, she is uh, an associate professor in uh, Barcelona and also holding several uh, other functions, but I would also kindly highlight the innovation and project man management advisor, which I think uh, sounds good uh, when it comes to today's uh, topic. Uh, throughout her career, she has harnessed her professionalism as an innovation manager, as mentioned, product manager and business development strategist. 
And she says, and we are quite convinced that she can operate effectively with customer relationships, uh, carry out tasks in a team environment, in large scale pro large scale projects, and also with world class innovation. And these skills, I think, will be used to introduce the Avart project and its selected topics for today's session. So, Loha, the floor is yours. Uh, 15 minutes as agreed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. I, am I audible? Can you hear me properly? Yes, loud and clear, and your slide is already on. Perfect. Then, yeah, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, as you mentioned, I will be um, presenting the word project, uh, focusing more on the port use case. Um, let me quickly see if I can change the slides. Um, just uh, quickly starting with a brief overview of the uh, project. Uh, it is a Horizon 2020 uh, project funded under digitization and tra transforming European um, industry and services, automated road uh, transport. Uh, in order to answer uh, to one of the challenges faced back then, and still I would believe uh, is, is faced by uh, European Union, which is efficient and safe, connected and automated AV duty vehicles and logistic operations. And um, the problem that award is focusing on is um, if these autonomous vehicles or automated vehicles um, that are supposed to uh, be operating in, in um, uh, logistic uh, can actually uh, be used in all weather conditions or what we call harsh weather conditions. So word or the word award comes from all weather autonomous real logistic operations and demonstrations. And as the word uh, or, or as the title uh, indicates, the focus of this project is uh, not only in automation of the vehicles, but also enabling them to operate within a different uh, um, weather, weather condition. Um, this is a 26 million project. Um, there are 29 partners. Uh, the project is coordinated by Easy Mile. Um, and here you can find uh, a list of other uh, partners who are involved actually in the project. Um, Award is developing um, an operating safe autonomous transport system or ATS in a wide range of uh, real life logistic use cases. Here you can see four use cases that the project is focusing on. The first one is the forklift use case, which is about autonomous loading and unloading of the forklift operations. The second use case is the hub to hub use case, uh, which is on the autonomous logistic shuttle services on public road. This is the only use case where we have uh, uh, kind of a mixed traffic and, and public road, with, which actually takes us out of the confined areas. Um, the third use case is the airport use case. Uh, and for this use case, or this is the only use case where we had uh, the snow and, and we tested the autonomous vehicle under uh, snow conditions. Um, and this uh, use case is on autonomous uh, ground support equipment. Uh, and the last use case, which I will be focusing on today more, uh, is the port use case, uh, which is on automated transfer operations and ship loading. Um, the systems that uh, we have used in award um, are able to under um, adverse environmental condition, which is the research question that, that the project is uh, focused on. Uh, and it also targets compliance with ISO 26262 and, and taking into consideration the sort of recommendations. We have lots of testings of the vehicle, uh, technical evaluation um, to actually check for sort of um, and also make sure that we are complying with ISO. Um, there are lots of sensor uh, systems um, uh, and, and teleoperation system actually incorporated into the vehicle to address the 24 seven availability. Um, uh, of the um, operations. Here you have a list of actually companies that are providing uh, as the technological components, uh, which uh, 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 gives us the other system, the award other system. Um, some of those partners are Foresight, Continental, Adaski, Inaftig, and Utopia. Utopia gives us the tele, uh, uh, the, uh, or, or is involved in the tele operation um, tasks within the project. 
And then, of course, um, we are using the applied uh, autonomy's fleet management system to optimize the fleet management and supervision uh, for logistic use cases. Um, we also have uh, OEMs integrated or, or, or actually as part of the project uh, who are providing as the vehicles uh, that are later on automated using the word uh, other system um, for the uh, port uh, use case, we are using the Terberg uh, uh, vehicle for the up to hub uh, use case, we are using the Kamag uh, vehicle. Uh, then for the airport, we are using uh, a vehicle provided by TLD. And for the forklift use case, we are using uh, Palfinger's forklift, which is uh, uh, optimized by the EIT, um, uh, Austrian Research uh, Center. Um, Hoffinger is not a partner within the project, um, but uh, we are using their uh, forklift and, and um, we try to automate the forklift using the other system of award. Um, since I mentioned the presentation will focus a little bit more on the port use case, um, a little bit, uh, I would like to provide a little bit more information on the port use case. The site um, that uh, we are doing the tests and pilots uh, is based in Rotterdam. Vlaarder um, Gen Port Terminal, it's a restricted or confined area. Um, the, uh, the, the all testing actually is focusing on the utilization of an automated Terberg tag um, for trailer movement within the terminal uh, premises. And the objective is to integrate automated trailer transfer with DFDS uh, terminal systems. Here we are using, as mentioned before, the fleet management system provided by Applied Autonomy um, and operate in a live environment with other vehicles um, and people. Um, here you can have a picture of the route um, that uh, the, the pilots um, have been demonstrated in. And the route is an ongoing route. Uh, the ongoing route actually includes the gate uh, transit uh, to and from the public road, as well as loading and unloading uh, operations on a ship. Uh, it is a roll on, the old terminal is actually a roll on, uh, roll off uh, terminal with ferry routes to uh, Immingham and uh, Felixstowe in the UK. And currently, it witnesses uh, 22 weekly departures, um, facilitating the transport of over 150,000 trailers um, annually from the Netherlands to the UK. And the, the uh, terminal currently houses a total of 32 uh, tags, uh, similar to the Turberg uh, track, uh, which are showing autonomous capabilities uh, serving various purposes. Uh, here in the project, uh, we focus on the um, uh, container uh, movement, but um, it can be used for other purposes as well. Uh, in the demonstration, we have three phases. Uh, the first phase actually focuses on the trailer, uh, uh, on the movement of the trailers from the point A to point B on the terminal ready to load a ship um, concluded in November. And the second phase is a public road. Here you can see in the picture, actually the first phase is this area. If you can also see my mouse, the second phase is actually the green one, uh, which is number two, uh, public road uh, for last mile delivery from the terminal to the public road, including gate um, in and out process. And the third uh, phase is this area where you can see the vessel. Um, it is actually demonstrating the sh uh, ship loading and unloading. So we actually demonstrated all these three phases uh, within the project already. Um, and um, within these uh, testing, we had nine scenarios uh, that were tested, uh, um, possible objects, uh, vehicle overtaken, uh, roundabout, etc. But we also had uh, diff different obstacles such as cars, pedestrians and different barriers, uh, including pallets actually put in front of the vehicle. Um, then we also simulated uh, the rain until 100 millimeter per hour. Um, that was for the uh, arch weather condition testing and um, also the trailer management report, uh, the three phases that I already explained um, uh, were part of the pilots and testing. Here I have a short video of actually how um, the, let me quickly see if I can play it and if you can hear it properly, um, how the 
board managers actually think about it and what uh, are the perceived uh, uh, benefits of uh, autonomous vehicles for port. Please let me know if uh, you can hear um, the video I'm playing. Can you hear the voice? Not yet. We see no. that you have unmuted. Yes or no? No. Otherwise, I'm, I, it should be fine. Um, I'm quickly actually showing you parts of the video. Um, it comes already with a uh, subtitle, so yeah. hopefully it is still um, fine, even if you cannot hear the voice. I'm going to mute it. You have to share your um, before you're sharing the, the screen. You have to share the uh, um, switch a button. So I should go to the settings, right? You can see some parts of actually the pilot here, um, and also some. Um, 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 statements uh, from the port as well as um, uh, the representative uh, of um, uh, the vehicle manufacturing uh, company. Um, also, uh, I believe Easy Mile, someone from on the back uh, on behalf of Easy Mile is talking. And the focus is actually um, to show you how it works. As you saw, um, it is um, in autonomous uh, mode. Uh, probably in the previous uh, part, you saw that um, the uh, driver had his um, hands on his lap, so uh, he was not using. And here are the different phases that I was uh, talking about previously. Um, just to give you a snap uh, shot of what actually happened during the testing week. This is the third phase. Here you can see the vehicle is already inside the vessel. Now it is actually trying to park. So that's the parking phase. And here are uh, some uh, shots of the fleet management system that was um, uh, also integrated to the system that DFTS is using to also automate the all ordering part um, in order to make sure that there is no human intervention. I believe I can, yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of finishing. So I just wanted to show actually how the test look like. Now I move forward. Um, so we did, uh, since <clears throat> the pilots are already finished, we collected lots of data. Um, we analyzed that data, but we also simulated future scenarios uh, when more uh, vehicles will be automated. And some results of the assessment um, uh, is actually shown in the slide. Uh, we can see that uh, when it comes to time saving, uh, we uh, might actually observe significant reduction in the time required for trailer rearrangement using a mix of automated and human operated vehicles. Uh, we also uh, will um, actually have full, uh, once we have full automation of trailer connection, and that can actually reduce to the cost by approximately 75% uh, percent for five automated vehicles. Um, I want to really highlight the um, full automation part because right now, even if the vehicle is automated, um, uh, we need a human or a person in order to uh, connect the trailer and, and disconnect it. So still, it's not that we completely actually get rid of uh, the human component. Um, but as soon as we can we can automate the whole process, it can actually uh, uh, result in 25% of uh, reduction in costs. 
Uh, operating five automated vehicles result also in 23% uh, lower cost compared to setup, including human operation with uh, part time support and teleoperation. Uh, why we mentioned five? Because with one, that kind of efficiency is not um, achieved. So we simulated for five vehicles, and if um, we have at least five automated vehicles, then uh, we can actually have 23% lower cost. Uh, uh, for setups and without part time support, costs are 81 percent uh, lower, which is a really high number. So there are lots of um, cost uh, aspects or reduction of cost aspects for uh, for the businesses uh, here, mainly for the logistic operators. And at least three automated vehicles are necessary for three hours of operation to achieve uh, cost savings. We actually simulated for five, but also uh, we had another scenario for, for three, and the three seems to be actually the minimum which is required. And increasing vehicle number is more effective than extending operational hours to the duration uh, required for uh, the trailer. Uh, connections. Um, these are some of the impact assessment or evaluation um, results that we have achieved so far. Um, of course, we will be talking more about um, the results uh, of the pilot um, in the final event of award. Here you can see um, um, more information about the final event, which happened on 13th of June uh, in Brussels from 9 to 5. Uh, I will be sending the link if you're interested to know more about the uh, port use case as well as um, other use cases of a word. Please do register and um, for the event and uh, we would like to see you in Brussels, hopefully in June. Um, for any other questions, please do write me an email. This is my email. Um, and I will then hopefully connect you with any partner who can better answer to the questions. Thank you so much, and I am giving the floor back to you, Robert. Thank you very much, especially for the excellent timing well prepared <clears throat> and uh, congratulations to your to your work in the Abart project. I think you are coming soon to the end of the project, so uh, we will be happy to share in these liaison activities to share further uh, outputs uh, when it comes to the to the development of, of, of the ports, which are kind of a leading uh, leading uh, group of, of logistics hubs who can who can uh, do more for for multimodality and and clean and green logistics. Uh, you mentioned uh, automation, uh, all these automation and digitalization uh, aspects need a high precise positioning uh, uh, of of several loading units or all the loading units and all the vehicles. Uh, this is what uh, is the topic which is picked out from the multi reload project, uh, which leads me to introduce the next speaker. I think Ahim is also around. Yes, uh, uh, the camera is also working. Ahim is uh, team leader for the multinational logistics uh, in the Department for Transportation Logistics at the Fraunhofer Institute for Material Flow and Logistics in Dortmund, Germany. He has more than 17 years experience in the field of applied research and consulting, which includes uh, market studies, ramp up analysis of new technologies and digitalization solutions for multimodal transports. Uh, one of the key uh, stakeholders in the multi reload project is the port of Duisburg. This is where also the selected demonstrator case takes place. And this is what Ahim will introduce us. And your slide is already online. So Ahim, the floor is yours again for 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I will show you in this uh, 50 minutes um, an overview of the multi reload um, project. And after that, I will go deeply, more deeply into the B1 demonstrator. Multi reload is uh, leaded by the port of Duisburg, as mentioned before. Other ports integrated in this project are port of Basel and uh, port of Vienna. We have 23 partners. Next slides, please. And uh, yeah, 
Multivilot stands for, for Port Solutions for Sustainable Mobility and for Efficient, Effective and Sustainable Multimodality. No, next slide, please. <laughs> um, we have three pillars we are uh, building on. Um, as in screen one uh, is um, more on the hardware side, this is smart multimodal logistics, where um, new solutions for uh, goods transport by, by inner waterway will be developed to uh, and and as well as on the, on the rail side. Um, the second pillar is the digital and automated multiple no, multimodal nodes and corridors. And the third pillar is um, on the business development where we have to, to say um, one big issue is that we ha also take into account the legal and regulatory aspects besides the business models. The other three no uh, pillars we have are we are focusing on the terminals as well as the nodes and the corridors on Rhine Alpine corridor and the Rhine Danube 10 corridor. Next slide, please. Yeah, here you see an overview of the um, seven demonstrators. Two are focusing on more on the development of, of containers and transport solutions. Five are focusing on the digital side, and um, I will tell you some more and go more in deeper into the B1 demonstrator, which are uh, focusing on the um, identification of the position of the trains uh, within the combined transport terminal. The others uh, go more deeply into the predictive maintenance for port handling equipment. The third one, B B3, is um, focusing on terminal simulation. So also data generation for the multimodal node digital twin. So all data will then go into this digital twin and will show the results here. So and the last one is multimodal corridor digital service. So have a look onto the main haulage from by in a waterway transport between the ports here. So the objectives of the multi reload project is, is that we want to accelerate the use of digital and automated processes. So there are not a lot of steps necessary to to uh, to get an, in the hinterland terminal automated. So yeah, one step mm -hmm. is P1 uh, besides other projects. So. We want to identify automation solutions and shift shifting potentials for multimodal transport to by increasing the multimodal transport transport efficiency, and especially focusing on the nodes. So digitalization, digitalization, data integration. Yeah. <coughs> so um, the B1 demonstrator focusing on automation of handling processes in inland terminals by data many mining the position of unload, of loading units. So um, we discussed before the project started with a lot of terminals and uh, what is needed to, to do to get an automation and combined transport terminals. And we have also other projects which are focusing on this point. And one issue is, was always where is the wagon, the container, the loading unit inside the terminal? Because the train never goes directly to buffer and then you know where the container is. Sometimes uh, it stands in the middle of the terminal at the end, so it's not clear where is the wagon, where is the loading, loading unit um, on the train. And so we want we focus in for we focus on this project with this issue. Data will be generated by the railgate before the terminal. So the so basic data, so either code of the loading unit, the wagon number, position of the container on the train, um, the pin settings uh, also are covered um, within the, this project. Um, the second step is to get data at the beginning of uh, the terminal. We set sensors uh, to are used to determine the tracks where the train or the wagons are go uh, in, so that you know. This is on, on track one, track four, two, track three, track four, for example. And then uh, we, at the moment, there will be um, some cameras and LiDAR sensors installed at the crane by the port of Duisport in one terminal, where we can then get the data from above the train. Um, we discussed here several other options like um, distance sensors from the, from, from the buffer, but the determination is not so good 
um, from from this point. So the the deviation is not so good. It's too too large. If the train stands in the middle, uh, ends in the middle of the terminal, the devi um, the deviations are two three meters. Uh, so it's not in in uh, good enough. We want um, uh, have an accuration of nearly centimeters. So you now you see at the uh, the right side some some graphics. Um, at the tops you see the, the distance sensor, but we will don't use it anymore or because the deviation is too big. We, we will. Um, Use the detections as I mentioned before by the rail gate and by the wheel set sensor at the tracks and from the cameras from above. Uh, with all these data sources, um, we we think that we can get a very accurate result. Um, some important issues arises during the, this project. For example, detection length of a buffer buffer because if you change a buffer during the maintenance. Um, sometimes it's not, not uh, the, the data is not correct anymore. So uh, and also the data from the length of buffer, it's if you push it the wagons into the terminals, and how hard you can do this, um, etc. Uh, um, you have um, yeah, the wagons is yeah is moving a little bit. So we have to need have to use the data from above and get the data between the wagons, and because on, on the data we can get in the middle point of the loading unit. Other issue is that you have to do this within the terminal process. No train will go over a train and have a look and show the results afterwards because the time is too long to. Um, only have a drive from the start of the train to the end of the train, so it will. The, the solution has to be work uh, has to be worked during the production process. So we have an iteration solution: first rail gate, reset sensor, and then during the handling process, the train gets the data from the new trains. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot at the moment. Um, last slide, slide back, please. Sorry. Um, Port of Duisburg is, will install some new sensors on the crane at the moment, and after this, we can try to uh, get the new data, additional data, and then we can test our solutions at the, in, 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 in the productive system. Besides this, um, we have a deliverable. Could be also interested for, for other project automated port and terminal operations for multiple nodes and roadmap. So we analyze uh, typical technical solutions. What what is needed? Also um, to 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 reach automation in the terminal, and we have a wide span of various dimensions. So challenges, potentials of automation for for multiple nodes, a strategic roadmap, legal frameworks, and risk analysis. Which are associated with automation, digital to technology. So we try to cover all dimensions and spans, very uh, the dimensions, um, and uh, did some ex uh, interviews with some expert in terminal operations uh, managers. And we see that uh, main focal point will be on digitization and um, get the data. Honestly, you see, I was very surprised. It's not so big, but you see that point track and trace by ETA. They say, um, yeah, we need three to five years to get the data. The terminal manager did this, etc., because the train, the train data to get the data from trains is some black holes, especially in Germany. We know this. Um, some surprising uh, results were here, but yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, some marketing also for our side. We had a very successful the new port days and a user form there from Multi Reload. And the next one will be on 14th of May in Duisport and the future logistics. And the third user form will be scheduled on the end of October, also on the new port days 2024. So 
we will be happy to see you there and uh, have some fruitful discussions in this user forums. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Wahim, for the comprehensive presentation and the and the details on the on the selected uh, topic and uh, also for for the marketing for the Danube Ports <laughs> Days, which is uh, organized by by ProDanube, our our uh, network of of uh, companies striving for better circumstances for the navigability on the on the Danube and also for multimodality. And this is what brings us to the multi reload project, and it's a good good cooperation and and uh, you are all highly invited already to this edition of the Danube Ports Days 2024. Uh, last but not least, I mean, in the in the past two presentations, we were talking about vehicles and, and positioning or let's say kind of point based uh, solution, if I can say so that, uh, but uh, with the four freight project presentation uh, and and the details or the selected details from four freight if i had a good look in the past uh, minutes we will also get a glimpse on how the technologies or how the available uh, ict technologies can bring in uh, and bring together elements to enhance multimodality and automation in ports the project and the selected uh, topics will be presented by Dr. Orestis Manos, and I think you are already online. Thank you very much. Uh, Orestis is uh, working for the Wings ICT Solutions uh, Company as uh, as a development engineer and and researchers, uh, and is holding PhD in physics from the Bielefeld University. He has extensive experience in the design fabrication simulation and characterization of thin film magnetic material systems and devices for storage, for sensoring and energy harvesting applications. With this introduction, Dr. Manos, I give you the floor for again 15 minutes for the short intro on the project and its relevant topic for today's session. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert, for the kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to share with uh, you all the platform. Uh, on behalf of uh, of our colleagues in For Freight, I would like to express our honor uh, to participate in this event. We consider this as a distinct uh, privilege to interact and uh, discuss with you about the opportunities to advance uh, significantly the transport and logistic uh, domain. Now, uh, regarding the multimodal uh, freight transportation, uh, as we know, uh, for this is the main goal of uh, for freight to advance significantly uh, the multimodal uh, transportation nodes and uh, most of the times uh, contradictory in terms of objectives. Uh, we run uh, uh, three use cases. Uh, one is in at the port of uh, Galati in Romania, where we combine uh, river and rail transportation. Uh, the second is uh, in uh, in Athens, uh, running a use case combining the port of Piraeus with uh, Athens International Airport. And uh, the third use case uh, is in the uh, port of uh, Valencia, and uh, which combines uh, Metro de Madrid also, which is the last mile uh, delivery um, entity here. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. First of all, uh, if we we are trying to uh, propose uh, some solutions, we have to identify the root causes of the problem, which are the identified obstacles in our case. Uh, the first main obstacle is uh, the lack of uh, unified management systems uh, by common interfaces, which inevitably leads to low uh, inter interoperability. The second. Uh, the second problem uh, is related with the uh, low digitalization of oh, yeah, uh, the logistic processes. And uh, the third uh, identified obstacle is about the suboptimal resource planning based on uh, outdated information. These uh, red codes generate uh some real world problems uh, which are very significant. Uh, 
we can see that uh, we have uh, increased cost, uh, numbers of uh, handling uh, errors, also increased the greenhouse gases emissions, which is uh, something very uh, crucial nowadays. Uh, Suboptimal resource allocation and customer service, uh, long delivery times, uh, strong dependence on fuel, which uh, has a strategic dimension uh, nowadays, uh, geopolitical uh, input in uh, in this uh, real world problem, uh, limited feasibility and uh, suboptimal inventory management and uh, transport and uh, logistic line uh, performance. Next slide, please. What do we propose? Uh, we aim to uh, create a platform, for phase platform, which uh, gives uh, uh, convincing uh, answers to uh, advance uh, the uh, uh, transport and logistic uh, modes, uh, several um, uh, combining several modes like uh, sea road, uh, sea to rail, road to road, road to rail, and road to air. How this uh, will be, uh, let's say, uh, will be achieved via the introduction of a set of uh, solvers. Uh, here we will see the categories of the solvers, uh, as you can see, and what the solvers are. The solvers are uh, software entities that they consume uh, several information from OBMs, parking sectors, legacy systems, third party applications. And via the use of advanced algorithms, uh, they can provide information about the estimated time of arrival of the freight um, at a certain end point, uh, providing information about uh, uh, aircraft or maybe putting this next aircraft recommenders, tracking the transport and logistic line performance, advancing uh, the resource capacity uh, via predicting this in a very accurate way. Uh, they can provide also a uh, per sub route transport time uh, cost and mission uh, predictor. They can uh, provide information about uh, warehouse planning optimizer and uh, cargo delivery time uh, duration system. Can I go to the next slide, please? Which are the key advancements? Via the use of uh, these solvers, we can establish uh, scalable and sustainable uh, multimodal logistic ecosystem. We can, uh, with prioritization of interoperability, efficiency, and uh, seamless connectivity. Of course, uh, we have the introduction of innovative features to enhance uh, logistic operations and with them. And uh, we can optimize significantly the multimodal uh, logistic services for both stakeholders and customers that they are involved in this case. Which technologies are used in our case? Of course, as we said, uh, since we uh, provide, uh, since we provide some uh, decision, uh, since we provide some suggestions, excuse me, uh, we have decision support systems on the use of resources and end-to-end uh, -end multimodal uh, transportation planning optimization. What is this? This is uh, the provision of uh, real-time door-to-door tracking. Uh, we can forecast of optimal routing, estimate time of arrival, uh, about the rational uh, utilization of resources and uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, multimodal transport planning. Uh, of course, uh, we will uh, uh, apply all this in a, in a uh, security framework, in a high security framework, by the use of the blockchain, uh, where we enhance uh, transparency, traceability, security, and the fragmentation of the logistic processes and then transaction between actors. Uh, we will combine the internet uh, of things, monitoring of low, uh, low roller cages, for example, in real time, and uh, many more uh, activities, of course, by the use of uh, advanced uh, connected protocols uh, that they use 5G, and uh, we will um, uh, use, of course, uh, cloud technology and uh, digital fields. Next slide, please. What is the key message and uh, what we want to, to give as a take home message? What is the business added value uh, related to the ports? So our platform, as I said, contains 
uh, a set of solvers. The combination of all these solvers and the interconnection uh, between each other, they can provide an answer, a convincing answer to a real world problem. What is the real world problem? The poor technique is required to push a large freight rate with the transport and logistic chain. Sometimes uh, most of the nodes, uh, for example, yeah, let's, let's take for instance the airport, they want to rationalize the income of this flow. Our flight platform provides a set of solvers promoting this endeavor while reducing the operational costs, and making the operation more efficient and secure while reducing uh, the handling errors. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my talk. I would like to thank you all for your uh, attendance. Uh, Robert, the floor is yours back. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the for freight uh, uh, summary. Uh, also, thank you with this. Uh, thank you uh, for all the project uh, presenters. Uh, thank you for for keeping the time. I think it was a good teaser to show. Uh, I mean, we all know what crucial role ports play in logistics and and in multimodality. Uh, we have seen that the the Avard project uh, coming to its or, or close to its closure, it has already takeaways from, from physically happened pilots. The sister projects uh, for freight and multi reload are in the phase of, of implementing their demos. They still have uh, uh, approximately half of the project uh, duration ahead uh, of those ahead of, of us. Uh, and ahead of us, speaking ahead of us, we have excellently uh, we are excellent uh, on time, and so we can we can embrace the whole uh, approximately 35 minutes, which were foreseen for a panel discussion, exactly for the topics uh, from the perspective of uh, stakeholders who can take away uh, bits and pieces, uh, hopefully rather larger pieces from the project uh, demos and 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 outputs, and integrate them into their uh, daily works. And let me now use the opportunity to introduce these panelists. We have, uh, and uh, hopefully I can pronounce all the names correctly. And please turn on the cameras. I, I think you are all online. Uh, Mr. Mats Kovsgaard Rasmussen from DFDS. Thank you and, and welcome. Uh, he is a seasoned professional in innovation management, project management, and uh, partnerships currently serving as the innovation project manager at DFDS. He has a proven track record of managing large and complex international projects with several stakeholders, with several objectives. And if I read correctly, you are partner uh, also in the Avart uh, project uh, when it comes to digitalization and automation of port operations. Thank you for being here. We have Dr. Andreas Gavrielidis from IMEC. Hello, Andreas. Hello. Nice to uh, meet you online. He is a senior postdoc at uh, at uh, ID Lab IMAC and the University of Antwerp, uh, where he is a principal research fellow in the field of mobile edge communication as part of the flexible networks team. He has a special research interest uh, in the 6G network of networks, which sounds already good, and application in vertical industries, including the transport and logistics. Thank you for being with us. And we also have here. Jose Andreas Jimenez Maldonado from TIC 4.0, and I think also representing the port of Valencia. Uh, who, and uh, you have uh, 18 years of experience in the logistics uh, slash ports uh, sector, being part of several innovation and research projects in the field of port logistics and the maritime transport. Uh, his fields of expertise are related to increasing the efficiency of logistics and port operations uh, through the development of the industry 4.0 models and technologies, and he is also 
currently Secretary General of the International Association Terminal Industry Committee, the famous TIC 4.0. Uh, and we agreed that uh, we could also question outside the panel uh, uh, from from the other speakers when it when 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 we have time for that and and I think it's going to be okay. Questions are obviously highly welcome from the from the audience, but uh, since I have the microphone, I have the pleasure to start with uh, with the first uh, introductory and let's say helicopter view uh, question formulated uh, during the preparations. Uh, we learned quite some about the projects. I think we all know what ports can and have to do for for multimodality and logistics, including digitalization and automation. But what are your key takeaways from your own organization perspective, company perspective that you plan to use uh, in your further business uh, operations? Uh, and let me start uh, with, with the order of introduction. Uh, Mats, if you could give us an insight from the DFDS perspective on that. Absolutely, and thank you for the introduction, Robert. Um, yeah, um, GFDS, we were part of the award project, which, uh, which Loha really well explained. I think I would start by explaining one thing, and um, DFDS, we transport trailers. Uh, and um, if you picked up on the video that Loha showed, uh, using turbid vehicles, we do horizontal moves on our terminals, which, which is actually quite important when we're talking about automation uh, and uh, automated vehicles. If you look at uh, Jose's uh, background, you see containers and they do vertical moves with the crane. And that is something we do not do on our vessels and in our operation. So that's actually a quite key distinction here to be set about automation of port logistics, uh, horizontal and vertical uh, integrations. Um, but as stated, um, we were part of the award project testing the uh, tractors in our terminal in Rotterdam. Uh, and for us, um, it was just also great to see this new piece of technology being tested uh, for the first time in a row row uh, trailer setting uh, in our kind of, of a terminal. Um, and it's really easy to see when we saw the vehicle moving around how this technology can support our operations in the future. Uh, in projects like awards, and, and we're also part of the Modi project, uh, where we are seeing uh, trucks on public road also driving in, in and from our terminals. Uh, it's a great chance to really see how this new technology, automated vehicle vehicles, can uh, can work in our supply chains and in our logistics chains. And with these projects, we get a really good shot at looking how to. Of, of, yeah, following the business case of implementing new technologies such as uh, automated vehicles. What what we especially learn from, from projects like Award is, is the system of system approach that we, we used in Award where we go uh, and analyze the entire operation. So not only the vehicle driving and what the vehicle needs to do, but also the physical and digital infrastructures, which we need to adapt. And we also, as Loha mentioned, has we have this fleet management system, which uh, translate the work orders or the missions from our terminal operating system over to the vehicle. Um, so physical digital infrastructure. Uh, and my last point will maybe be that uh, there's a. I think we should realize there's a bunch of partners uh, when uh, automating terminal operations. We have ADS providers like Ismail, Turbuk, the OEM. We have the terminal operator and we each have separate tasks we need to digitize and automate in order to make a full chain uh, possible here for automated logistics. And then we're using the learnings from the award demonstration to set the specific uh, use cases and targets for the next uh, rollout and the next step of automated vehicles. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we will come back to some of your or several of, of your points in the next uh, half hour. Uh, Andreas, we have uh, heard in, in the For Freight presentation that one of the outputs will be a platform or a marketplace. Uh, what can that bring to you and maybe your business environment over there? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, I will talk both from the side of IMEC, uh, of IMEC and also from the side of the project. So for, for IMEC, 
we're primarily uh, a research organization, so we're focused heavily on R and D, and we 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 deal with. Uh, on our side, at least on the side of IVET that I'm working in the uh, connectivity technologies and uh, how to apply this in vertical industries, as mentioned before. So uh, I'll grasp through the presentation that was presented by my dear colleague, Dr. Manos, and the output of the for freight project, the major output being the for freight platform, will work as a, a sandbox and a marketplace at the same time, meaning that we are aiming to attract several stakeholders. We're going to use this platform to be able to uh, innovate based on uh, uh, innovations coming from various stakeholders. So we, we value the input from, uh, for example, port authorities. Uh, in Antwerp, we have a very uh, close collaboration with the, University, with the port of Antwerp Bruges, which is the second largest port, uh, uh, river port in Europe. So, uh, the city itself is very, very tightly connected with the, with the port. So for us, uh, being able to uh, improve automation at the at, at the port and uh, by extension, uh, incorporate new technologies and know how these technologies might we will seamlessly operate through the corporate platform. So for example, we we develop uh, many solvers uh, which are uh, which vary from IoT uh, related uh, solvers to uh, AI machine learning models uh, for optimizing routes, uh, reducing carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, uh, the combination for multimodality. So uh, the routes from uh, land, land to uh, sea to land, land to air, which is something that is of great concern to a lot of stakeholders, be it uh, a telco or a, tele, a, a, telco, a telco operator, which wants to establish a, a private network to enable this kind of technologies to the uh, truck company itself, which uh, has the interest of uh, increasing profits, of course, but increasing profits should not come against the sustainability aspects. This is also something that we're aiming to tackle through the solutions provided by the freight platform. Now, as a project, of course, we are uh, trying to uh, foresee beyond the end of the project. So what are we leaving behind as a project? We're leaving behind uh, this kind of uh, platform that will operate, uh, will extend after the project and in, in incorporate into the uh, digital ecosystem that Europe is trying to promote. Green technologies, sustainable mobility, and as the as um, as our previous uh, speaker said, autonomous vehicles is also a very big part of this uh, um, effort to apply. So this platform. Uh, in my opinion, does not uh, confine itself into, oh, we have the solution, but this solution is a prototype for further development, and we invite all relevant stakeholders to come and test our solution once it's ready and provide their input. In. So this is the business aspect of the um, platform itself. Thank you very much. I think you, you mentioned the, the keyword, and this is what we are also uh, facing in the in the Danube region, especially with the inland uh, waterway perspective, that digitalization should not be there to to digitalize, or not only, but the users also need to feel that it brings something for them, uh, okay. and for that we obviously need the standards. But uh, we sometimes say that uh, the end user is not necessarily interested in how the standard works. He or she needs to be clear that uh, they can use the solutions anytime uh, and everywhere, especially when it comes to multimodal operations in ports. And maybe Jose can guide us or, or have some uh, key uh, aspects on that when it comes to standardization and how, for example, your operators uh, can or will make use of it, because I think you are also in in the in the beginning steps of, of, of this process. So if you could if you could give us your perspective, what the businesses could use, or what your uh, port can use out of these project initiatives. Thank you. Uh, first of all, good morning to everyone, and thanks for inviting me to this session. It's a pleasure. Uh, so, uh, with regards to standardization and, and uh, operational and digital standards and, and the projects that uh, we are seeing in this this morning, uh, from our perspective, um, talking uh, from the TIC 4.0 perspective, who is the, the association uh, promoting the development of, of this 
type of standards. We see these that these are very, very good examples and a very good field test where uh, where to test the applicability of, of those standards. And, and uh, at the same time, uh, the way we apply these standards can provide uh, benefits or can demonstrate the the power or, or the flexibility that they can offer to break some uh, well established um, barriers at this moment in the uh, in the global logistic chain and and the multi multimodal chains uh, which are in fact very very fragmented and and that's one of the things that the uh, standards are uh, trying to uh, contribute to uh, decrease this effect of fragmentation so uh, one key aspect is uh, advancing towards more interoperability the, uh, among the uh, involved legacy systems that very many end users have. Uh, and, and in this respect, for example, uh, using for freight uh, as an example, we are uh, a stick for point zero. We are um, testing different types of standards that uh, are uh, we expect that are contributing to favor this uh, or to increase this level of uh, major interoperability between the systems involved in uh, in the for freight platform for example uh, also talking about the solvers that uh, my colleague andreas introduced and before orestes uh, this type of solvers are uh, or need um, different types of information coming from different sources it's type of of sources provide this data in the in different formats with different structures. So in order to make these solvers or solutions more efficient, we need to find a way to uh, harmonize uh, the structure of this data to to make them make these solvers uh, efficient and make these solutions or uh, uh, give the, the the added value to the user. So uh, standards can favor this. Um, creating this common layer where the information can be expressed in the same way. Uh, and this is uh, just talking about digitalization, which is a prerequisite for automation, for further automation of processes or equipment. So this is in my, in a nutshell, or in summary, my view on how standards are, or how the role of standards can contribute in, in uh, all these projects. Thank you very much for these introductory uh, words. We have more, or we will have more on that. Uh, Ahim, you already mentioned some aspects from, from the selected uh, multi-reload uh, uh, demo, but maybe in this session you can you could also highlight one or two concrete points, what, what those uh, precise measurements will bring on the one hand to the operators in, uh, in Duisport and for the users of the of the services in the in the chain. Yeah. Um, maybe I can start with the B1 demonstrator again. Um, the problem is often also in, in combined transport terminals for the automation, you have a lot of small components you have to put together. So um, it's not enough to, to automate the crane itself. We did it before for Contago in a in project, but you also have to need more data about the position of the loading unit. You have need uh, more information for for the terminal trucks, etc. And B1 helps to generate data to get to to reach automation status and to um, help other processes, other components. Uh, to yeah to fulfill it and uh, and thus these all small components then um, helps to to make the terminal more efficient as i mentioned before in the combined transport terminal it's not enough to 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 get the crane automated because it's then it's not productive enough so this is the chain here um if you look at other demonstrators um in, in multi reload like the um b5 demonstrator which has a look at the in a waterway transport and the ETA for, for the terminals and the document exchange. Um, in my opinion, my um, experience from the multimodal transport in the last year, the, the problem is the lack of data and the lack of data exchange between the partners. And here, 
the demonstrator helps to chain, give the, the, all actors along the transport chain the actual real-time information to then implement added services like ETER or have uh, sufficient information for an efficient planning of a combined transport terminal. So it's an all small components to help to increase the efficiency of a multimodal transport chain in, in, in com yeah, complete. Yeah. Great, uh, thanks Thanks for these words. Uh, we kindly encourage the, the participants also to, to, to post questions either in the chat box or, or by raising the, the hand. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we also prepared some, some other questions uh, until the other colleagues are posing. Uh, back to Mats, what or how can the automated vehicles support your your pro your processes and and maybe when it comes to the whole industry in a in a in the long term, uh, including challenges and uh, I think this challenge question I can pose later uh, to 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 all of you. What are the challenges? And and the very practical question what I wanted to uh, check personally if in the in the video we have seen that there is still a driver sitting. Uh, on the vehicle, but uh, hands in the in the labs. Is that due to safety uh, prescriptions? Will they always need to stay on, bo on board, uh, or or in the longer term can they also uh, join the remote uh, center somewhere? So three questions in in one package. Yeah, and <clears throat> thank you, Robert. I will start with the last one. The, the vision and the business case from our side is definitely we need to remove the driver. If we are, so, and, and what I usually, when I talk about automated vehicle, I say that in the future we will have electrical uh, tractors on our terminal. So that's roughly double, triple the price, let's say in, in rough terms, right? And then you add automation uh, ADS stacks on top of it. Uh, and if we still need to have the driver on board, then it's triple the the cost of the vehicle. So, so we definitely need to to remove the driver to have a positive economic business case in the future. Um, and then, if if we we look at the benefits of automated vehicles, then then I think the value propositions are quite well known in the industry by now. But efficiency, safety, uh, and transparency also in the operations. Um, we have some global trends or some social societal trends that we that we're also facing in in the maritime industry and and logistics industry about scarce resources and it's difficult to attract new employees. Um, so so there's a bunch of value propositions which automated vehicles can support. Um, uh, and some some of the challenges, and and I will try to make it brief because it's Akim also mentioned it, data and and the entire digital setup of the the transport uh, and the planning of it. Uh, back to removing the driver, we need a full automated digital process chain to make this work and to make it profitable for us as as an operator to invest in it. So we also have some investments on our side to take to support the implementation of, of the vehicles. But we need a fully automated uh, process around the vehicle and we need a fully automated digital process uh, supporting uh, the operation. Another question popping up uh, still still with you, Mats, is that uh, we heard in, in, uh, in uh, autonomous, so in, in road traffic with, with private cars, uh, Technical question: Can you operate in an environment where your competitor operating in the same port is not using uh, autonomous uh, vehicles? Can can you envisage a mixed environment, or or is that not what what you are envis envisioning? I um I don't have a clear answer on that. That's a million dollar question. But I think when we are envisioning and, and seeing the the transport system of the future, we see a, a mix uh, between the the human and, and automated vehicles. Um, I don't think that we can, on the short term, uh, anticipate that all our customers they go automated and autonomous. Um, but we can try and control our part of the, the logistics chain uh, as a beginning. Um, and then I, I maybe left out one thing here. So, so and, and I, I 
do this also when I'm talking about automated vehicles, but I tend to talk about the technological challenges. There's also a human factor to it. Um, if we're accepting automated vehicles and, and um, accepting digitalization in, in general, and there's also labor unions, uh, which we as terminal operators, we need to address. And definitely for most of our terminals, we will have tough discussions uh, when implementing uh, automated autonomous vehicles. One question before giving the floor, uh, because I see a hand uh, uh, up. Uh, you more or less all mentioned uh, that data and obviously data are crucial in digitalization and automation and, and in the whole uh, logistics uh, process, lack of data. And uh, one might think that all the data are there. Let's just use some big data uh, technologies and it should be OK. A uh, question to the to the four freight colleagues, and you can uh, throw the coin uh, who is answering from from which perspective. Uh, so one might say that all the data are there. We just need to come together. But do all the operators want to come together to a to a bigger good? How do you see that uh, from the standardization and 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 from the business perspective? Up to you who who answers, who is brave enough to answer the question. Uh, Andreas, if you want to go ahead. No, no, please, please, we can go. We can both go. I mean, please, okay. uh, so <laughs> ahead and then I can follow Smart. with the with the other way. <laughs> okay, I, I I'll just will give a a, a short uh, um, uh, reaction on on your question, which is really the, uh, uh, interesting topic in the in the industry about the data. Uh, yes, that's true. There are a lot. And big amounts of data out there. Uh, problem is that not all is not always easy to order or to structure in a comprehensive way all this data. That's we were talk. That's why we are talking about uh, standardizing the information. Even within the same uh, company, you may find lots of uh, silos of information managed by uh, systems that, that are not uh, interoperable. So, yes, data is available, uh, but maybe not as easy as uh, we think. And uh, the second aspect is that we still uh, need uh, more uh, capacity to understand data and to extract value from that. Uh, and in the in, in this industry precisely in the poor logistics or logistics industry uh, i think that we are going to experience a, a highly demand of uh, very skilled uh, professionals science scientific data scientists or data scientists uh, that we would need to extract this value from from the current data that we know that it's there but maybe we are not just in position to get the full of that. So that's my, and now Andreas, if you want to, of course, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, you raised a very, very good point. Um, from from my our perspective, there, there, are, there is the issue of, of course, unifying the data, but also obtaining the data. So we see, we've seen through other projects as well that uh, not all, uh, for example, not all partners of a project or not all companies that might really like would like to uh, have some automated processes or some models to to, to work with are not. Uh, the, we see that there are complex procedures inside the organizations of getting the data uh, itself to train a model. There are a lot of legal issues to be able to, to overcome. So uh, it is not just a sim and. and uh, fabricating data is not always the way to go because fabric fabricating data does lead. Yeah, you could uh, argue that. Yeah, why not just take some some readily available data and then you just uh, extrapolate and, and fabricate and, and train a model. Yeah, but it's not as simple as that. Unfortunately, uh, if you want to actually implement a solution, end-to-end -end solution for a process, whatever that process might be, optimization of a route or, or, or and sort, you need historical data. You need data. You need live data. This by itself is a very, very big challenge, especially in an industry as fragmented as transport and logistics. 
uh, you cannot uh, uh, easily go to a, to, a, to a cargo company, for example, or to uh, a transportation or to a, a, an air transport company and ask them for their logs. Where, what, what, are, what are the routes? And uh, oh, please install this, these sensors on your vehicles because either they have sensitive cargo or there is a policy inside the company, inside a big company many times that does not allow this data. So from my perspective, there are issues on that end as well. So to overcome them, it's not as simple as say, yeah, please give us your data and we will give you some models because then there are all sorts of uh, privacy and security um, uh, cases to be addressed as well through legal departments. And so, yeah, there are these kind of issues to uh, obtain. We try to overcome them by refining the approaches, by providing proof of concept, which is also one of the goals of, of the first rate platform, for example. If I, if I can... Uh, provide uh, a ready-made proof of concept to the stakeholders, maybe we can ease them into this overall European uh, initiative and start uh, being more open to data provision. But it takes, it will take a long time to, to reach that point. Thank you for highlighting these 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 challenges. Uh, several things may be easy, but uh, at yeah. the end of the day, it's not that easy. Uh, I see from the audience that uh, Mr. Suchu has a contribution or, or a question. Please introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Yes, Mr. Uh, thank, thank you. And thank you for the um, opportunity to speak. So um, um, I'm, I'm Mr. Suchu, um, uh, part of also um, uh, the For Faith project. Uh, from from their side, maybe as a, as a follow up, uh, you you mentioned also the 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 keyword of of standardization. So I was interested in in uh, the different projects where you see more more um, effort, where more um, activity in this uh, standardization in the interoperability. So more on the modeling part, more on the uh, data, or or maybe on on other uh, topics. Uh, I, I assume is, is that a question for me? Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> it can be uh, a, a okay. discussion or a round table for, for each project where, where you focus your uh, activities. Yeah, well, uh, I can tell you the current uh, status uh, of uh, the, the work that we are developing in uh, within the, uh, this association, TIC 4.0. And there, there is a, a remarkable effort uh, right now in building uh, data models that reflect all the processes that are taking place in uh, in port operations, in port logistics. Uh, of, we have started uh, from the port terminal perspective. So the current available data models are very much focused on uh, internal logistics in uh, basically in, in port container terminals. But uh, we are our will, our willing is also to expand those data models towards other uh, scenarios, other logistics uh, landscapes, as we are seeing here. Maybe also outside the pure port terminal operations towards the hinterland uh, logistics, for example, or the relationship, the connectivity between the port and the hinterland. Uh, I think in that areas there is a huge uh, opportunity. There are huge opportunities to to test and and implement uh, these new standards. I, I think that the main challenge now is to develop proof of concepts uh, like these projects are doing to demonstrate quick gainings of uh, the produced by the application of those standards. Uh, there is a reluctancy in general. Uh, I wouldn't say against the standards, of course, but I can say, uh, or my perception, like many others in the sector, think, think that the transport and logistics is maybe uh, more conservative than other industries. So uh, it takes some time and effort to introduce innovations. And, and standardization can be seen as an innovation, so to say, in the sector. So I think that uh, we have a, a challenge ahead which is demonstrating the uh, utility of uh, using a standards. Everybody is talking very positively about that. Now I think we we, we need to, to demonstrate them. And with this uh, favor that this adoption becomes, uh, you know, more spread and, and more wide, wider in the in the sector. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so you see already this kind of data spaces concept uh, coming to to um, towards um, the mm -hmm. data models that that you are um, extending now, or or this is too far, let's say from. from. Uh, well, I, I would say that we we have already have uh, what not maybe data spaces yet, but we have examples of data lakes okay. in in uh, several. Uh, in facilities in several uh, ports, uh, data lakes that are created that have been created with TIC standards. So the expected evolution of that is to, as I say, expand those data lakes towards more uh, scenarios, logistics uh, scenarios, and then uh, why not? Yes, it could be the the next step or the next level would be evolving this to our more data data spaces as you say uh, but it, of course this will require some time <laughs> okay thank, thank you thank you very much when it comes about uh, data collection and data 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 there is a question in the chat box uh, from uh, Dirk Stalens, uh, hopefully I propose it, uh, the name correctly. Is the data that is collected in the project used as input for a digital twin to simulate processes or activities in a port or terminal? Uh, on behalf of the multi-reload, if I might change the hat or, or go with the hat, uh, yes, in the multi-reload project, there is a digital twin uh, uh, being prepared, taking into uh, taking in several aspects uh, also from from currently uh, in currently under uh, installation uh, uh, sensors. Uh, so yes, in, in multi reload, there will be a, a digital twin built up. Uh, anyone from the Avart project can answer that question. Or in the meantime, on behalf of the four freight uh, project. Do you plan a digital twin in the four freight? That's basically the question, I think. And do you plan a digital twin in the Avard? Or in Avard, I think it's more than planning or should be more than planning if it's if it's uh, coming to an end. So is there a digital twin in the Avard and will there be a digital twin built up for your uh, tasks in, in four freight? So for for freight, uh, if, if I may, uh, we are planning to have a digital twin solution as part of the platform. So there will be uh, a service provided as a digital twin there. But in our case, it will more or less uh, be uh, well. We're planning also a, a digital twin esque, if I can say, on the on the Port of Valencia uh, solutions provided. Let's say for the next drop of. Uh, solution. So the, pl the platform is basically going to take uh, multiple forms. So we're going to release a first version and then a second version. So our goal with our digital twin in that platform is for uh, uh, it's it goes back to my um, sandbox, um, let's say, uh, point that users will be able to uh, uh, toy around with this concept of digital twin and introduce uh, uh, more users on what is a digital twin, what are the capabilities of the digital twin, and why would, would we invest in in creating uh, more complicated and more uh, and larger digital twin environments for future solutions? On behalf of a word, I don't know, Mads, if you would like to answer. Um, I mean, we, it depends actually how we define a digital twin. We don't have a concept such as a digital twin actually introduced in a word, but we do map actually the trajectories uh, wherever the pilot is done. If you consider that as a digital twin of the infrastructure, yes, we do have a digital twin, but that's why I wanted to start with how you define actually a digital twin. We do map prior to the pilots. We do actually uh, take the coordinates of all the places where the pilot will be demonstrated. We create a digital map of that. Um, and this is how the vehicle is guided. Um, um, but we don't actually concentrate that much on digital twin as such or as it is actually perceived in the industry. Mads, you're I'm muted. Mads, something is wrong with the mic. I have seen that you dropped out and in to recheck, but we currently don't hear you. 
right now you're muted. If you unmute yourself, hopefully it will be. Uh, no, it seems you've got some problems. Yeah, I think uh, the question of what is a digital twin, it would also be a, be worth a separate one and a half hour uh, workshop just on the question of of digital twins. Uh, I don't know if Mats, you were able to. No, can you hear me now? Yes. Now, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, great. Yeah, sorry, I had some laptop issues. Um, I think if, maybe just a comment on what Loha said. Then also, if you project setting this all with the uh, purposes and then deploying uh, the new award ADS on uh, on existing vehicle platforms with these mile ADS so the the objective of award is is not so much about uh, digital twin uh, technology rather than testing new sensor technologies and automated vehicles and autonomous vehicles Thank you. Under, understood. As, and as mentioned, this whole digital twin topic would be worth uh, another uh, uh, workshop in itself. Uh, but when coming to workshops, I think we are closing to the end with with perfect timing. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the in the chat or, or or from the audience. And I think we tackled more or less all the ones uh, which we have pre prepared. Thank you for the panelists uh, as well. Uh, for for your time and and uh, valuable inputs. Uh, if I need to conclude uh, this session on on our behalf, uh, uh, first of all, thanks for the organization, uh, my colleague Christian, and also the the Avard and and Four Freight uh, teams, especially to to Luca and and his team. Uh, I think it was a very good learning to to see uh, some key planned and already available takeaways based on the status of, of the different uh, EU funded projects. I think it's also great to see projects coming together on concrete topics and having some business or, or industry uh, view on that. Uh, automation is clear, data collection or the lack of data is clear uh, that, that we need to go further on that. And obviously we need to go further or all all the projects need to go further on really develop delivering benefits out of these projects to the end users and then at the end of the day for the whole European community. Uh, thank you very much for having me and and multi reload as uh, the main moderator of the session. Thank you again for all the preparations, the slides and the panel discussions and uh, it was a great pleasure. Uh, see you at other events, for example, at your final event or at our Danube Ports Days virtually or in person in Budapest as well. Uh, and with that, thanks for the third time and back to Luca as the main mastermind behind session, behind the today's session. Ahim, you raised the hand. I raised the wrong hand. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Then we discuss separately at the project meeting. Uh, back to Luca for closing yeah, this. Thank, thank you very much. So I just want to say um, I will send the slides of the project presentation and the recording later today and tomorrow. And you will also find the webinar blog online in the coming days. So I would like to close the session uh, to, to thank uh, Robert for moderating the event all the speakers and the panelists and everyone who contributed to this joint event. So if there are no further questions, I wish you a good day and thank you for being here. A real pleasure.